I'm going to read a couple sections from my thesis, which is, <clears throat> it's a working title is Crossing Dad's Wake. And I got, <clears throat> I got inspired about this particular theme because I have two pictures of him and of me, both in white uniforms, both in almost the same pose. And I got to thinking, I bet our careers have touched in other areas. And so uh, that's generated into this, uh, my thesis here. Uh, the first section I'm going to read uh, entails my returning to port on the island of Guam on a submarine, and then the second part will deal with my father. Surface, surface, screamed the one MC. Men scurried to their stations for the surfacing maneuver. I swung out of the rack, landing softly. The deck was already tilting upward, causing me to lean to my right to counter the motion as the boat ascended. Some loose items, a few cans, someone's smelly leather boondocker work shoes, tumbled toward me, brushing my ankles on their way aft. Shoving my gear into the sea bag, I picked up the top of the bedpan, the locker upon which my mattress rested. I found and changed into my dungarees, the work uniform most associated with sailors, chambray blue shirt and bell-bottom dungaree trousers. I grabbed my cover and shoved it into the waistband at the back of my trousers to crown my head later when topside. I gathered up my skivvies, my civvies, extra poopy suits, and other sundries, and stuffed them into the sea bag. Fastening it closed, I tossed it onto my old rack. I made my way to the radio shack, my duty station on board, while the boat crested the ocean's surface. When at last we bobbed to the surface, I felt the boat's wallowing in the slight swells. The hatch to the sail was opened, and the officer of the deck and other crewmen clambered to their appointed stations atop the bridge. Fresh air engulfed our sewer pipe. This time the air was really fresh, because we were far enough away from port. I didn't think that fresh air would stink when I first went to sea in a submarine, but it does when the boat's close to a pier and the hatch opens, allowing one to smell real air, not the man-made air one's grown accustomed to while underway in a sub. Close ashore in the harbor, the air is full of the smell of rotting sea life, leaked oil and land smells, such as from restaurants or factories, or whatever the dominant odor maker might be. The diesel engine fired up, sending wafts of oily fumes to mix with the salty sea breeze. Believe it or not, I found the diesel fumes reassuring. Another announcement, announcement blared over the 1MC. The following is a test of the ship's alarm for the bridge. Disregard. It was followed by a series of hoots, gongs, whistles, and horns to remind all aboard of the various hazards the boat could possibly endure. Minutes later, a similar announcement was made for the control room. The OOD energized the periscope camera and the small TV monitor hanging on the bulkhead of our radio shack blinked awake. <clears throat> we were able to see what the OOD or whoever was manning the scope saw. For too long, we saw only the empty ocean. Then almost suddenly, the horizon became crowded with large and small craft, naval and merchant alike. We saw a couple Navy tugboats approach us and swing about to hover on either flank, shepherding us to shelter. Not quick enough for the crew's liking, the scope was soon filled with larger-than-life images of the island magnified by the scope. The slope of Guam's vo idle vo volcano, the innumerable palm trees, snatches of beach, some rocky, some sandy smooth, none with naked women. My attention was pulled away from the pair of us to perform last-minute security sweeps of the radio room, making sure our workspaces were devoid of classified information. We could feel the slight bumps as the tugs nestled alongside. We weren't far from the pier. Excitement intensified as the whole crew ready for shore. The line handlers aboard were called to their positions topside as the crew routinely conducted all the business of mooring. Sound-powered phones passed orders back and forth. Alarms were tested. Outgoing mail and other official correspondence was passed up through the weapons hatch, the large main hatch abaft the sail used to on and offload the torpedoes. Our focus directed elsewhere. We didn't hear the officer of the deck and the captain as they expertly guided us to shore. After agonizing minutes, the boat was pierside. The skipper ordered all engines secured, and the colors were shifted to the boat's stern. I mustered back with my team to the wardroom. Our division officer, an ensign who spent years as a sailor before being commissioned as an officer, ordered us to begin carrying the boxes to the weapon hatch. Some of us, including me, climbed up the ladder and stood topside, at last in the light of a sun we hadn't seen for weeks. The boxes of classified material began their journey out of the hull. We formed a human chain, passing the boxes from man to man until they reached the brow of the boat and then on to the couriers to the, on the cement pier beside a government van. In between passing boxes, 
I tried to see as much as I could of the outside world. It was wonderful. The last box turned over to the couriers. My shipmates and I reluctantly climbed back down the hatch into our sewer pipe. We gathered up our sea bags, and this time the whole team headed topside. As we neared the gangway, we stopped, turned and saluted the small American flag, the colors, flying proudly from the sail. We turned once more and saluted the petty, off the petty officer of the watch, standing by the rail leading to the gangway, muttering, request permission to go ashore. Returning our salutes, the POOW replied, granted. As we stepped ashore onto solid ground, some of us waved to friends we made along, among the few topside crew before being herded to three great passenger vans. After stowing our gear in the van's rear, we, pulled, we piled in. The vans pulled away from the pier and headed landward. The scenery wasn't especially noteworthy. There were the usual industrial-style, bland-looking buildings favored by the military the world over, some Navy housing units for families, really only dilapidated apartment-style units, and a smattering of stores such as the Navy's department store, the Base Exchange, or BX. In minutes, we were outside the confines of the base proper and driven to a cluster of two-story concrete buildings, obviously barracks. The vans pulled up to the bachelor quarters office, where we were given room assignments. As I stepped out of the van, I looked about. I walked to the main road. I recognized it for the time ten years before, when a much younger me and my family had been stationed here for three years. I thought to myself, here I am again, crossing Dad's wake. Especially at the beginning, um, there was a lot of, uh, and, and I assume it must be purposeful, uh, use of Navy jargon, uh, yeah, yeah. mention um, uh, your, your rack and, and all of these, you know, some that I knew and some that I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wonder if you could speak on that. Uh, I assume it's intentional, and um, it, it is, what, what's the purpose? It was, it was an an authorial plus an authoritative choice because I wanted to own this piece. I wanted the, the reader to know that's where I did. This is how we talk about the things that are on board my submarine. Mm 